Look in the mirror, scream self love. Look in the mirror, scream self love. Self love kill your demons. Self love heal your heart. Self love give you confidence. The confidence that you need, huh? It kill you all your insecurities, huh? Self love. I can, I, can, I can bust it out. Uh, what's up, everybody? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All righty then. Um, is everybody here from Oklahoma? Yeah. Everybody? Okay. Anybody here from Oklahoma City? Everybody from out here in Norman? Oklahoma City? Okay. Okay. Everybody from Norman? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. 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 So let me ask you, are you people from Oklahoma? Everybody from Oklahoma? Yeah. Have you heard of Deep Deuce? No, I'm asking you. If you're from Oklahoma, have you heard of the Deep Deuce? No. Mm, nobody's heard of Deep Deuce. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about Deep Deuce. Deep Deuce is the area in Oklahoma City that is now considered Bricktown. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history about it, and um, so you can learn out, you know, just learn something new about it. So uh, today we're going to talk about the Deep Deuce, and we're also going to make the connection to my books that I've written, uh, Slave Minds and Black and Business. And you have to say this in business, okay? Black and business. So the key takeaways is um, what is broke can be fixed. I want you all to remember that because I'm going to come back to this at the end of the presentation. What is broke can be fixed. Black history is American history because it happened in America. So we're talking about black history. I think it's important to remember this is an important aspect of American history as we all are here in America as one. Um, and everyone is great, but only a few choose to be. So without any uh, further words, I'm going to get into it. So uh, I'm going to talk about the beginning of Deep Deuce. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Oklahoma history. Is anybody here familiar with the land run? Okay. So this is around the time when the land run, right after the land run, you know, when they, everybody picked their land and everything, the area in Bricktown known as Deep Deuce, that was like a warehouse area. And so black people kind of migrated to that area as this was the kind of jobs they were taking. While they were uh, taking jobs in that area, they started creating homes and different communities for people to live in. Um, in about 1910, they said about 7,000 African-Americans stayed uh, in the Deep Deuce area. Um, what this presented is an opportunity. The more people in the area, the more things you can possibly get done in terms of um, businesses, um, education, different services that you want to offer to the community. So that was the kind of opportunity that they had took. And by 1920, has everybody in here played Monopoly? Excellent. So that's what they started doing. They started playing Monopoly, exactly. So they started playing Monopoly, started acquiring a uh, property. Um, the Aldridge Theater, Theater, we'll talk about that here in a second, um, Slaughter's Hall, uh, Ruby's Dance Hall and Grill. Um, and then uh, in 1945, they really got real big in the uh, entertainment industry. A lot of famous artists and things like that, jazz musicians would come down, they would go to the Deep Deuces. It was a thriving area in Oklahoma City for black people. So we already talked about that. Have you heard of Deep Deuce, which everyone hasn't, which is fine. So this is the Deep Deuce Media. Um, this is the um, Black Dispatch, and this was founded in um, 1915 by Roscoe Dungy. Um, Mr. Dungy also helped found the um, NAACP in Oklahoma City. So um, he was kind of a pioneer in the Deep Deuce area, a pioneer in the Deep Deuce area as far as just um, organizing people, getting things set up, and uh, making a community out of the area. Now, the Aldridge Theater, theater, theater. Um, this was the place where all the jazz musicians and everyone would come. So it was very popular um, back in the 1920s and uh, when it first had began, especially going into the 1940s and 50s. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what happened to the area, why Deep Deuce isn't um, a thriving area where black people stay at primarily. But this was a pretty good um, um, addition for the area. Like I said, it brought a lot of people in from out of town that wanted to spend money. Um, now, Ralph Allison, now if you know about, has anybody heard of Ralph Allison? They had a library on 23rd. It's named after him, uh, Ralph Ellison, and we call him an East Side legend because of what he brought um, to the to the industry of writing. Um, he grew up in Deep Deuce. He's the author of The Invisible Man. Has anybody heard of The Invisible Man? Very interesting book. Have y'all read it? Anybody read it? You read it? What you What you think about it? <laughs> That's all good. So, but for that, he won the National Book Award. Um, the Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Arts. So yeah, Ralph Ellison is an East Side legend. Um, another pioneer of business, um, Dr. D.L. Haywood, 
he pioneered the um, first um, uh, Utopia Hospital. Utopia Hospitals is uh, was like one of one of the first hospitals downtown in that area. So after that, they took it from Utopia, and it was I, I believe it went to Presbyterian, and it's what's now called OU Medical Center. So that's something I didn't even know as I was putting this together. They were talking about that. But um, he bought the Haywood building back in 1918. Again, they were kind of playing Monopoly going into 1920. And the best way to create a thriving community, and especially businesses, is to own property and acquire property, like a Monopoly. Uh, the Lyons family, um, the Luster Lyon estate, I believe this is like one of the um, like one of the top houses in that area. Like it was supposed to be like a high scale house uh, during those times. A lot of the properties weren't as uh, I would say as massive as that as, as this one. And even if you do go um, kind of, I would say over there by OU Medical Center and everything, if you all guys are ever driving in that area off of Lincoln, I don't know if you if you all know your streets like that. But in that area, you'll still see houses that kind of look like this in the old district, um, also off of class and on the west side of Oklahoma City. So, um, yeah, this, so this is kind of when those houses first were uh, built. And I believe this is uh, Sydney Lyons, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, yeah, this uh, house is also on the, currently on the uh, National Register of Historical Places. So um, it's a pretty significant uh, piece of Deep Deuce. And this is a quick video that I wanted to show you all. Second Street was a wonderful place to live up until probably the, the early 60s is when the demise really, really began. Once um, Clara Luke began to break down the walls of segregation through public accommodation, that began the change. Once we could begin to not only go in Johnny Brown's and shop for clothes, but could also eat that began to change. So when we could go to any place and go and, and do business any place, that began the demise of the African American business district. So it was a price of the price. NPC and church do anything to bring my day dash back to earth. I never wrote a verse. They put them in that hearse. I've been dead since it's 24. I've been cursed. Now, did y'all hear what he said? Oh, my bad. Was the music too loud? My bad. Okay, so basically what he was saying was, the, the last part, we said the demise of the Black Wall, I mean, uh, Deep Deuce. Did anyone hear him say that? Okay, so what he was talking about was when they desegregated everything. You see, back in these days, you know, you're talking about 7,000 to 10,000 people staying in one specific area. Because of that, the people wanted to move out. So when things became open, when Black people can go where white people were at, so on and so forth, they left the deep deuce area, thus taking that money out of the community. So that's kind of why the area began to decline because no one lived there anymore and no one spent money there anymore. So that's kind of what threw it off. But, oops, I need to do that again. So um, in my book, Slave Minds, um, what happened to the people was they were um, victims of what I call mental programming. And um, after the segregation, like I was saying, um, it demolished uh, black people. They, they began to move all over Oklahoma City. And when they moved all over Oklahoma City, they left Deep Deuce, and Deep Deuce just went to nothing. So, um, but like the man said, it was a sacrifice. But like, I, you know, again, black people left the black community. So black people are leaving the black community. How is that? You know, we got, we want to build the black community. Um, but anyway, uh, mental programming. Back, um, has it, do it, does anybody know about marketing? Anybody know about marketing? Okay, good. So we're going to talk about emotional marketing. Now, in these days, I, and I'll say, I forget the term. I forget what time of the, of the uh, like 1950s, 60s, uh, keeping up with the Joneses was a term that people would use. To me, this is a, also a form of uh, emotional marketing. They have houses. They show you pictures of things that look better. When you get there, it's essentially a copy and paste house. This house is like that house, and that house is like that house, so on and so forth. You see what I'm saying? So that's the emotional marketing that goes into this that swayed blacks to move from the black communities. And this isn't in just Oklahoma City, this is essentially all over the country. To get people to move to sell real estate, they say, okay, look, segregation is over, come get these nice houses, now you can come live in these areas. So it was a different way to market, and I, I wouldn't say manipulate, but to tap into the emotion of wanting to have more for yourself, the emotion of uh, wanting to have a better life. So, you know, just be careful when people are marketing this stuff to you. Um, Exactly. Uh, man, it was a movie I saw this year. I forget who was in it. I know. Um, but anyway, the quote in the movie was, people are desperate to feel good, sound smart, and be right. 
Um, there's another form of marketing that I kind of talk about in my book, tapping into the emotions, the emotions of wanting to be the one that's the smartest and always right and always looking good and looking cool and everybody. That's an emotion. Um, it's really dealing with your ego, but I'm not even going to go there. I see some of y'all eyes are kind of uh, losing me. <laughs> but also, um, I talked about TV programming. So the stuff you watch in uh, TV programming and so social media, does anybody know what an algorithm is? Excellent. So y'all know some stuff. So TV programming and social algorithms are essentially the same thing. Everything that you click on your phone, every time you're on YouTube, um, it's a system that's tracking your algorithm to see how many times you click on it, uh, how long you're looking at it, and how many times a week you do it. They're tracking that stuff and they use that to market uh, products and services to you. So remember that when you get on your phone, has anyone ever gotten on their phone and been talking about, man, I want a red popsicle. You get on your phone, it's a red popsicle. But I'm just saying, does it come on your phone when you when you look at your device? It, algorithms. It's just the algorithm. So it's nothing to be afraid of, just something to be aware of so you can know what people are presenting to you so you can make a good choice for yourself as a consumer. That's what that's about. So um, the part I want to talk about in my book, my Eastside Times bestseller, Black in Business, um, the point I wanted to relay here, um, oh, I got some of the same stuff. Well, really it was just teamwork. Uh, teamwork is what helped bring the community together. Without the team, you can achieve no dream. Um, Coach Weber will tell you, if you're playing a, in a basketball game, one against five, more than likely the person that's won is going to lose. So that's kind of what I had uh, brought from that book. Oh, also, edumacation. Edumacation. So this is a, a combination of just, I, I would say, common sense. And it's kind of a word I made up myself. But I, I said edumacation in a book. And um, what, I, what I discovered throughout my life, um, you know, my kids, I have kids, I have a, a son that's in the seventh grade and I also have a six-year-old. And they're like, why we got to go to school? You know, sometimes you wonder, like, why am I in school for? Well, you're here. Or you, okay, I'm about to tell you. You're here to learn how to solve problems, math problems, science problems, English problems. So you learn how to solve problems in school. So when you become an adult, then you really know how to solve problems. And that's how you make money, by solving problems. The more problems you can solve, the more money you can make. And you can't ask anybody up in here. But, uh, yes, also, remember, literacy. Literacy. Reading helps you solve problems. The better you can read, the more literate you are, the more problems you'll be able to solve, the more words you'll know, the more ways you'll be able to figure out how to come up with a resolution or a cost-effective solution. So, again, what is broke can be fixed. These are our key takeaways. So when I say what is broke can be fixed is the black community, everybody say, oh, they don't have this, they don't have that. Well, they don't, but it can still be fixed with some teamwork and some unity. Um, and again, everyone is great, but only a few are going to choose to be. Every, everybody here can do something special with their life, but who's going to get up and put the work in to do that? Whatever it is you want to do, I don't care what it is or how easy it is, you're still going to have to do some type of work. And that's kind of what school teaches you, how to put, in, put the work in to achieve a certain goal. And remember, black history is a part of American history. We don't want to separate the two because that's what confuses everybody. It makes it feel like we don't have anything. We're, here, we're Americans as well. So this black history that we're talking about is a big part of American history, even if it isn't getting taught like that. So I just want everybody to understand that. And that's all I have. So anybody have any questions, any thoughts? Send a hand pop up. Question. Yes. What about like people that like were there any white people that came around and like ruined DQ for this? Oh yes, yes. Uh you said they ruined it? Like white people. Like what do you mean they came around? I mean they came around and I'm pretty sure they uh were they were they like prevalent as far as owning businesses and companies and stuff like that? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not gonna lie. To be honest, deep dudes, it's, it's not a lot. Of, it's not a lot of information out on it. You don't see a lot of documents. Um, I, I did quite a bit of research, and if you Google the deep dudes, um, it's almost all on one Google page. It's a few blog blurbs about it, but to really get the deep dudes history, you probably have to go to the historical Oklahoma Historical Museum to really get all the official artifacts, uh, the paperwork, different. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, they was down there, though. I'm pretty sure they were down there. I just wasn't there, so I don't know. 100%. <laughs> yes, ma'am, you have a question. Ah, uh, no, it doesn't. Have you been to Bricktown in Oklahoma City? Yes. Okay, well, back then it didn't have all the brick roads. Um, it was a little bit more industrial. It had more um, industrious buildings, like factories and things like that. Um, so no, nah, it doesn't look the same as it, it doesn't look anything like this now. Yes, sir. 
I made eight. I, I've made eight books. Well, really, I'm on nine right now, but yeah. I write, I write a lot. That's what I like, I really do. Yes, sir. That's a good question. And that's why I said it's American history. You see, black people felt like, well, we, we, we don't have anything. We're oppressed people. We came out of slavery. So the government, for some reason, you know, decided to give them, uh, black people, Black History Month. Now, I'm not going to lie. I don't know all the facts into what started Black History Month. But if you ask me, I feel kind of I, I like with you, you know, I feel like making Black History Month separates black people from America. And like we said, we're all Americans. So I went, when I studied history when I was in college, I had a wonderful, amazing teacher. She taught me um, U.S. history, 1865 to present. And she didn't skip a beat. She talked about the black part of it. She talked about the white part of it. Everybody's part that was involved in building America to where we're at today, the Reconstruction area, uh, all, all these different um, eras of America that, you know, just sometimes you had a time to talk about it. But, yeah, to answer your question, I don't know the exact reason why they did it, but it was done to um, give black people something to be proud about if i had to take a guess on it um i don't know the exact reason but it's something that black people can use and they can look back at and say this is our history because we don't have assets and you know so on and so forth so yeah is that a good answer for you was that good for you okay that's a good question yeah <laughs> Well, I mean, there's so many different forms of history that you need to learn about. Um, some of the people that pioneered of America, like the Rockefellers, um, uh, Henry Ford, people like that. Uh, did you all know Henry Ford only had an eighth grade education? And he went out and started the Ford uh, Motor Company and everything? So these are different things that I think that uh, we all should learn about because everybody has some type of history that's special that created America. Um, Latino history, Latino Month in August, I believe. Um, learning about American Indians, learning about... You can't. Yeah, you really can't. That's why I that's why I said we should have a whole just put it in the curriculum. Put Black History Month in the American history curriculum. That's what I would do. All right, who 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 was next? Who? Okay, okay. Uh besides these two? Yes, I've written six more with the ninth on the way. By being a better, oh, by being a better person. Like racism. Right, yeah. That's why I thought you might say, yeah, just by being a better person. Just because you see them do it don't mean you go and do it. Um, that's a logic that you'd be surprised a lot of adults will use, too. Well, they're doing it, so I, I decided to do it, too. So by you going out and being a better person to everyone you come encounter with, that's going to be the beginning of breaking that curse. Um, man, a few things. I, I would say um, it, it, it was a, a God-driven purpose. I never wanted to be a writer when I was a kid. Uh, when I was you all age, if you would have walked up to me with $10 million cash and said, hey, you're going to be a writer one day, I would have said no. Um, the thoughts, the visions, the stuff just comes to me, and I put it out for the world in, in hopes of helping people and inspiring people to do better in their personal lives. My number one purpose for writing, I would say, is to help people. I'm going to agree yeah, yeah. Um, what kind of vehicles did they have these two? Uh, they had horses. Uh, yeah, wagons. They had horses. Because, you know, in Deep Deuce, we're talking about 1920s. So, you know, slavery ended in 1865. So some of the people that were alive back then were slaves. So they were on horses. You know, they were getting it how they lived, you know, as one would say. <laughs> you feel like high school schools cancel out a lot of the bad stuff from our history? Um, no, I, I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not hundred percent sure. So I would have to say no, because I don't know what I would say is like, uh, we were talking about sometimes you don't have enough time to put it all into one thing. If we went back through all of the history of America, I mean, that's like, it's a lot, that's a college course. You know what I mean? And that's why they have it like at college, they have it separated like 1865 to present. Then you have 1865. to I think like, uh, 1490 when America, when Columbus and all them came over here. So yeah, that's kind of how they, they have it uh, broken up sometimes. Are 
Like, yeah, it's all. No, no, no. Yeah, everything is a uh, hundred percent non-fictional. But I'm working on doing some fictional books. I'm trying to get into my storytelling. But that's like I have these other books I'm doing, and then I want to get into my storytelling. But yeah, I'll definitely be getting that soon. You got another question? Okay. What are the names? Um. So my first book, Slave Minds. This is the first book I wrote in 2019. After this, I produced a poetry book called Dr. Two Pins uh, Books of Rhymes. After that, I wrote, let's see, um, The Ten Professional Commandments, which is a pretty good book. It's just a book just giving people a professional code they can live by. Um, after that, I wrote The Professional Chronicles, Volume 1, which is a book composed of my blogs, and I, I added a couple extra blogs in there. Then I wrote uh, Black and Business. Yes. Wrote Black in Business, um, one of my favorite books. And then after that, I wrote Drew Brown's Guideline to Get Off the Sideline. And this is a book that anybody having a problem in life, I have five steps to help you get up off the sideline. And then I produce two daily journals um, where you take kind of notes that you track in your day. It has positive affirmations, and it's a tool that you can use to help decompress mentally. It's like a mental tool, like a mental screwdriver. Okay. Yes. Um, if I had to say founded, I, I, I would I would think that it was 1910. I would say 1910 when they said this is the deep deuce and this is what we're kind of rolling with. Yeah. Uh, what was the first country you traveled? The first country. The first country. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna say Egypt, maybe. If I had to take a swing at it, I'm gonna get him right. What age were you? I was 36, I believe. Yeah, 36. A basketball player. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah, I couldn't see anything. In fact, when I went to college, my whole purpose of going to college wasn't even to go to college and graduate. I was going to play basketball strictly. Yeah, I didn't care about graduating, then I ended up graduating. Yes, sir. 39. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get, what's up? What made you become a book Like I was saying earlier, I felt like it was just um, something that just kind of came to me. I'm a person, I can talk a lot. If you can talk a lot, you can definitely write a lot. So I can sit here and talk, 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 talk. You know what I mean? So instead of talking a lot, I write a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, what did people wear back then? Um, suits, you know, old style fashion, real, uh, I would say ball ready, like they were going to a, a nice elegant dinner or something like that. You know, ladies have on dresses and everything. If they're working men, maybe some boots and some work trousers and a top, you know, something real simple. Uh, no, nah. not that I could think of. I mean, not that everybody doesn't already know, you know what I mean? Uh, he could play basketball. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Obama can hoop. Yeah. He, he got a little, yeah. <laughs> right in the back. You're 39 now. Was your birthday in 1983? Yep. I was born in the late 1900s. Yeah. <laughs> What's up? Oh wow! Oh, let me get let me, let me get her question. Let me get let me get her last question. Which one? Man, it just depends. Right now, I've been on um, three months to about three months to eight months. Um, I've been doing a lot of audio books too. I've been getting into doing audio books, so that takes a little bit longer to sit here and read the book all day, and then you mess up and you see you need to go back and recorrect something in the book. So I say anywhere from three to eight months. I had to get one of mine then. But yeah, but thank you all for having me. Well, thank you. Hey, give a big one. Thank you for your time, man. Oh, dude, no problem. Hey, uh, great job, Pam. Great showing them what Pam can do, all right? Now, everybody stay seated over here, please. Stay seated. We got, uh, we got another gentleman coming over now to talk about our teacher.
I know, I really appreciate it, man. You know, my boy Sam said, I need it. Yeah, look, look in the mirror, scream self love. Look in the mirror, scream self love. So love kill your demons, so love heal your heart, so love give you confidence, the confidence that you need, huh? It kill you all your insecurities, huh? So 